So I'm here today to talk to you about how we use Cockroach to power our SaaS product, Starburst Galaxy. Uh, so as you mentioned, um, some background. Uh, Starburst is built on top of Trino, which is an open source uh, distributed SQL query engine for analytics over big data sets. Uh, so like as we saw um, in one of the previous talks, like you load a bunch of log data into S3, um, like great, okay, now I've got 100 terabytes of log files in S3, what do I do with it? Well, that's where Trino comes in. Trino lets you uh, efficiently and quickly run standard SQL queries over it to uh, get some like insights out of all this data that you're storing. And uh, Trino queries data where it lives. You don't have to load it somewhere else or do a bunch of transformations before you can query it. Like you just load, uh, connect Trino up to your data and then let your people can run standard SQL queries over it. Uh, we wrote Trino at Facebook um, and open sourced it in 2013. Uh, we originally did it to allow analysts at Facebook to uh, run interactive queries over their data warehouse, and it quickly expanded into ETL and built a bunch of other um, data products on top of it. Uh, we also um, grew it into a huge open source community. Um, it was pretty amazing to see it. Like now it's used by thousands of organizations all around the world. We have like hundreds of, or thousands of contributors. Um, and so like, it was pretty crazy to see a product that like we started off with just four people, you know, writing code from literally a blank slate, and now it's this like massive project um, that even lots of people in the room are using. Uh, importantly, um, Trino runs on a cluster of machines uh, similar to Cockroach, uh, because Trino is typically accessing massive data volumes. It needs to live close to it needs to run close to where the data lives, because uh, you don't want to be pulling like terabytes or petabytes of data over the network, because your network people will get upset or you'll get like a huge bill from your cloud provider. And we'll see why um, that's important um, when it comes to our usage of Cockroach. So Starburst Galaxy is our SaaS product built on top of Trino. Like uh, nobody likes to run software, at least most people don't. And so uh, we built a SaaS product so that people um, can just go to a web interface, click a few buttons and uh, get up and running with Trino. Uh, so the first thing you do um, when you go to Starburst Galaxy is you'll tell us where's your data sources. So maybe you've got data in like a cloud storage system like Amazon S3. Maybe you've got a traditional database like MySQL, Postgres, or Cockroach. Um, or maybe it's in a, a SaaS solution like uh, Snowflake. So you give us credentials, tell us how to access that data. Uh, and then you say, okay, I want to create a Trino cluster. I want to talk to these data sources. Uh, this is how big I want the cluster to be, like how many machines. And then most importantly, where do I want this cluster to run? Like which cloud provider and which region is it gonna run in? And then once your cluster is up and running, now you can just run standard SQL queries over it. Like that table that you're querying, you know, that could be like a, a tiny table in MySQL, it could be like a 100 terabyte table like store in, in S3. Um, it doesn't matter, you just like write standard SQL against it. Uh, so Starburst Galaxy has to store a whole lot of operational data. Like you've got all your clusters, it's gotta manage like the state of those clusters, like what version they are, if they're out of date, uh, the deployment status. Um, it's got a full authentication and authorization system uh, using a role-based access control model. Um, and all that data is stored in Cockroach. And so you've got like users and roles and permissions assigned to these roles. And every time you run a Trino query, uh, the Trino cluster has to end up talking back into Cockroach to actually perform these uh, authorization actions. And so a single Trino query could translate into like dozens of queries against Cockroach. And so it's important that those are fast and reliable. Uh, so we have a picture here of what uh, the Galaxy architecture looks like. Um, so we have Trino planes, or you might think of them as data planes, um, where the end uh, customer's uh, Trino clusters run. And those Trino planes are basically in every cloud region where any of our customers are going to have data. So maybe if they have data in like Google Compute in, in South Asia, or they have it like in, in Azure on the US West Coast, we have to have a Trino plane there so that they can run their Trino cluster there. Uh, and then we have a separate control plane layer. And for simplicity purposes, that control plane only runs in um, Amazon, because it's a lot more difficult to run stuff across multiple clouds. Uh, and this control plane, it's spread out across the world um, in different regions uh, so that those regions are geographically um, close to where all the Trino planes are. And then the control planes are talking to CockroachDB, and we run a CockroachDB instance um, in every uh, control plane. 
so that the control plane um, interactions with Cockroach are always talking to local and so that those are always uh, fast with low latency. All right, so why did we pick Cockroach for uh, Galaxy? Um, we actually picked Cockroach, uh, we built Galaxy last year. Um, we picked, Galaxy, we picked uh, Cockroach in the beginning, um, so it was a, a Greenfield project, and so we were able to uh, design our usage of Cockroach um, as we built the product, and it turned out like it was a very natural fit and uh, solved a whole lot of problems for us. Uh, so the most important thing in a database is that it's reliable, that it doesn't uh, lose your data, that you always get the correct answer, um, and that it's highly available, because if the database is down, then your entire application is down, and your customers are not gonna be happy. Uh, because our product runs in multiple regions around the world, it's important that the database is always up, um, even if we lose a, a cloud zone or a cloud region. Like you probably see in the news, like when Amazon US East One goes down, like it takes out half the internet. And so, you know, if our customers have, aren't using Amazon or they're in a different region, we don't want them to pay the price because like we chose to just stick it in a single region. So uh, we have to be basically as available as our customers' data is. And because we have customers all around the world, we need a database that lets us provide low latency no matter where in the world the customer is. Uh, development efficiency is another important thing that we're looking at. Uh, as we grow the engineering team, we're gonna get new engineers that are familiar with distributed databases or esoteric concepts like the CAP theorem or eventual consistency. So the fact that Cockroach is just standard SQL semantics and works like Postgres, that's a huge plus, because our engineers can just join the team and immediately know what they're doing. Uh, the fact that Cockroach also supports um, like unique indexes and foreign keys and constraints uh, lets us uh, put as much um, logic in the database as possible and force our, enforce our business logic there so that bugs in the application um, don't cause data corruption uh, or at least there's less chance of that happening. Like we'd rather write a constraint both in the database and in the application than miss the constraint at all and have a bug. And uh, serializable transactions are a huge plus because it lets developers um, not have to focus on like those kind of concurrency semantics about like, oh, if I read some data in my application and then do some transformations and write it back out, like am I gonna, if somebody else updated the data in the meantime, and I, am I gonna have like a stale result? Um, serializability, uh, Basically, all those problems go away as long as developers always follow the simple rule that always do your region writes in the same transaction, and then everything just works. And finally, um, operations uh, was an important point, that we're running a SaaS, like our, our SRE team, they have a lot to deal with just running the SaaS for our customers. We don't also want to have to deal with running a database, because we know that's really hard to do. So it was great, well, we, we were really only interested in a product that uh, somebody else could run for us. So um, the fact that Cockroach has a managed SaaS service, like that was great because um, their their team just runs it and we don't have to deal with that. Uh, as we add features to our application, um, pretty much every feature that we add involves uh, modifying the database schema. We're either like adding columns to a table, we're creating new tables, we're modifying indexes, we're even changing the structure of uh, existing tables. Like we've even had to um, change primary keys in the past, and uh, you know, that, that's never fun, no matter what database you're doing it in. Um, the fact that like Cockroach lets you do that in a completely online manner without uh, impacting the application, like that, that's huge. Um, when uh, I worked at Facebook, uh, they used MySQL for all of their online data storage, and they spent years writing a system to allow online schema changes, and it was still pretty cumbersome to use and like took many hours to do schema changes. So the fact that Cockroach, you can just do like alter table and it works like that, that's amazing and saves huge amounts of time for development. And finally, that uh, Cockroach can scale automatically to larger clusters. We don't have to deal with like manually sharding the data or worrying about, oh, if we have to like add machines or you know, something, um, how are we gonna deal with that? Like Cockroach just uh, handles that automatically, at least at um, our scale. I'm sure like when you get into like hundreds of machines, it's probably more difficult, but we don't have to deal with that yet. All right, so uh, how does Galaxy uh, use uh, CockroachDB? What kinds of data are we storing it? So we have uh, all of the cluster management data about like the user's Trino clusters. Um, that's all stored, like how are they deployed? What versions are they running? Um, do they need to be updated? Uh, all of the user and permission data, um, so the whole RBAC system, that's all built on Cockroach. Um, we do a bunch of recursive queries because you can have like roles that have 
child roles and child roles under them. And so the fact that Cockroach is standard SQL and can, we can write these complex um, recursive queries to handle RBAC, uh, that made it uh, so much easier. We didn't have to you know, try to do all that in our application code and you know, have, have the bugs associated with that. Uh, we also store metadata for users tables um, in CockroachDB if they choose. So if you've got that log data on S3, you can tell us like, these are the columns, these are the data types. We store that back into Cockroach. And then when you rerun that Trino query against that data, uh, we pull that metadata um, out of Cockroach. Uh, every time you run a query in Trino, uh, we store the query history for it um, back into Cockroach as well. So uh, for each query, uh, we store like the explain plan, we store the actual query, how long it took, um, lots of performance information about like the different stages of the queries, how long they took who ran the query, auditing information, like which tables and columns were accessed. Um, all of that gets stored like into basically a, a big kind of blob um, stored back into Cockroach. And uh, that data set ends up being like thousands of times larger than all of our other data. Um, but the great thing is that Cockroach just scales. So when we built that feature, we just store it all back into Cockroach and we actually don't have to worry about it. Whereas if we're using like other database systems, we'd be thinking about how do we shard this data? How do we distribute it? And, but Cockroach um, just let us handle that automatically. Uh, and then we have um, like a query routing layer that uses uh, Cockroach to store a transient state. Um, if we didn't have something like Cockroach, we'd have to have like a gossip system or some way for these like services to sync their information with each other. But with Cockroach, just write it back into Cockroach and, and don't worry about it. So as we were designing our database, we we're looking at how do we geo uh, distribute our data. Cockroach actually gives you a lot of different ways to do it, and depending on um, your uh, depending on your application and what kind of trade-offs you want to have around latency. Like, uh, probably everyone knows, like, you know, there's the speed of light limitation around latency, so that you just you can't get around that. So fundamentally, you have to be thinking about latency and where things are in the world. Like, if you're going from the U.S. to Asia, there's like 80 to 100 milliseconds of latency that is gonna be there no matter what. So you need to make trade-offs in your application and just think about how you're gonna deal with that. And Cockroach gives you those uh, tools to deal with it. So the first thing we thought about was, okay, uh, let's use regional by row so that uh, a customer's data can be close to where the customer lives. That makes sense. Except when we find out that actually our customers are gonna have data in different places. So like a multinational customer, they might have analysts in the US, they might have analysts in Asia, and we wanna give both of them a good experience. Whereas if we just you know, say, okay, all the data is gonna be in the US for that customer, their analysts in Asia are gonna have a terrible time. Uh, so what we ended up doing was global tables. Uh, global tables allow instant reads from anywhere. So no matter where in the world you are, the reads um, cheap, assuming you have a, a cockroach uh, instance there, um, at the cost of high writes, because you're basically doing a write into the future and so you do a write and it has to wait for that to, prop, like, to be in the future or propagate everywhere. Um, the good thing is that our application actually, we don't do a whole lot of writes for most things. Most writes are management operations where someone's going in the UI, they're changing a the cluster configuration. So like you click save in the UI and it takes 500 milliseconds, that's not a big deal. Whereas if you're running a Trino query and you do an ARP and it, it's gotta do like a dozen RBAC queries against Cockroach, those need to be like in the millisecond range. And so global tables uh, solve that problem. Uh, one issue we found with, um, with glo global tables is that when you're doing transactions for writes, if you're not writing to the primary region, there's a per statement latency for every single of those write operations and the transaction. Um, we, do, we have an audit log table, so every time you do something, we write to the audit log table and we write to the underlying tables. And so like if the, if the primary region is in the US and you're doing that right from Asia and you've got that 100 millisecond latency, then every single right operation in that transaction is gonna add 100 milliseconds and that adds up really quickly. And that's on top of the, uh, the, the, the high latency for the global table right. And so we solve that by, um, if a right request comes in to an API service um, not in the primary region, we forward that entire API request to a server in the primary region. And then that transaction is always running locally against the local cockroach. And so you, you get rid of that um, per, uh, per statement latency. Uh, if cockroach had like stored procedures or like some way to like ship the entire transaction uh, to the primary, um, that would be another way to get around it. Um, so maybe in the future. All right, so uh, one of the biggest things, 
so probably the uh, biggest um, operational issue we have to deal with is schema migrations, like making changes to our, our database schema, um, because basically everything else in Cockroach is just taken care of, taken care of for us with the managed service. Um, so the stuff we have to deal with is uh, changing the schema. So we use Flyway, which is um, a great uh, migration tool um, in Java. It lets you write uh, just normal SQL. Um, some other tools, like you have to like express it in like kind of like an XML format where you're doing it like a high layer and it's translated into SQL. Um, really, like we just want to write alter table statements so we know exactly what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, um, Flyway was written before Cockroach had transactions, and it's so it's like out of date and broken. So we wrote a a completely new version of it, so that just runs using standard Cockroach transactions, including updating of the, uh, the schema history table. And we're working with uh, Cockroach to uh, get that upstreamed, um, but you can find it on uh, our version of it on GitHub if you're interested. So one issue that we found with uh, migrations is you need to be very careful about mixing DML, like updates and delete statements, um, with DDL, which are like alter table statements. Um, so we hit here, we have an example where we create a table and then insert some values into it, including um, a null value. And then we begin a transaction, like as if um, we're doing a migration against this table. So begin a transaction, we do an update to multiply all the values by two, and then we do an alter table statement where we add a not null constraint for the column, and then we commit. And of course, uh, this fails because it's a, um, because uh, one of the values is null, so the, the not null constraint can't be added to the table. We get this interesting error message that maybe you've seen, uh, transaction committed but schema change aborted with error. Okay, so what actually happened here? So we select from the table and we see that the update statement actually ran, it updated our values, but the constraint obviously was not added because there was a null value. So if we'd written a migration um, with these two mixed statements, um, the transaction committed, but it wasn't actually atomic. So like it didn't actually um, maintain the transaction semantics. And now our database is in an inconsistent state. And like somebody's got to go and fix this manually. And so you really want to avoid um, mixing those um, because then that's going to be a huge operational issue to deal with. Uh, another thing we found is like don't try to be too clever with transactions uh, when you're writing migrations. Um, so another example, we create a table, um, insert a value into it. And then begin a transaction, we try to, we add a new column well, that's not null with a default of zero. So what we want to do is add this column and then give it a default value for all of the existing rows. And then, okay, now that, all, now that the existing rows have this default value, we should be able to drop the default and now the column is a not null column and we commit the transaction. Uh, but we get this error in saying that the null value in column Y violates the not null constraint, which is kind of unexpected because it, by the time the alter column runs, it should have a default. Well, it turns out like the way Cockroach implements transactions for DDL, it kind of seems like they, they look at the, not the, the state of the table before the, tr before the transaction started rather than like its state within the transaction. Whereas if you ran these two statements um, in separate transactions, it would actually work. So basically just don't try to get too clever and put things in separate transactions if you can when you're doing DDL because transactions in DDL don't, always work the way you expect. Uh, so we came up with some rules that uh, for our developers when they're writing these um, migrations to just avoid problems. Like basically any DDL, like an alter table that, that touches existing data has a possibility of failing. So like if you're trying to add a constraint and any of the rows are gonna violate that constraint, that DDL can fail. Um, so uh, DDL is really only safe if it's not touching um, Existing, existing rows. So never mix DML and DDL if the DDL has a possibility of failing or uh, triple check that it's actually not going to fail based on the existing data in your database. Otherwise, you're gonna have a bad time and you're gonna have to manually fix your database. Um, don't try to do multiple alter tables for the same table in the same transaction like as we previously saw because it probably won't work. So just generally, use separate transactions for your migrations um, unless you absolutely have to have that um, uh, atomicity in the same transaction, and if you do, if you do put stuff in a transaction, um, test it thoroughly on a copy of your data to make sure that it's actually going to work. Thank you.